on World News Tonight this Tuesday. Mikasa Sukasa. Trump shows the first sign of opening doors to let the new homeowners in at the White House. As President-elect Joe Biden decides to appoint a few familiar faces to the top jobs in his government. Health is near. Rival vaccine producers are running a close race in producing the most effective and safe COVID vaccine at an unprecedented speed. First one the candidate expected in early December. Hide and seek. A meeting between Saudi Prince and Israeli Prime Minister has taken up much debate as both parties don't seem to want to recognize it. And to the moon, China decides to respond to claims of neo-colonialism with a unique touch. From Ada Verna News Headquarters in Colombo, this is World News. Reporting tonight from Studio 24, here's Mahesh Jani. A very good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me right here on World News and thank you very much for the privilege of your time. A lot to report to you tonight as per recent developments on the global stage. As we start our coverage tonight, we have some good news for you. British drugs group AstraZeneca and the University of Oxford say they are jointly developed Vaccine against COVID-19 has shown an average efficiency of 70% in trials. However, the 70% average is lower compared to the efficacy of coronavirus vaccine trial by rivals Pfizer and BioNTech and Medina, which have come into about 90%. Hailed as a vaccine for the world, it's far cheaper to produce and easier to store because it doesn't need to be frozen. Tonight, three billion doses are being promised next year. Over 20,000 people took part in the trials, including participants in age groups most at risk. The preliminary results published today by Oxford University show 70% effectiveness, better than a flu vaccine. That compares with this month's results from Pfizer and Moderna, both more than 90%. But surprisingly, a smaller first dose of the Oxford vaccine gave it 90% effectiveness too. And it uses tried and tested technology. A 30,000 participant trial is still underway in the US. Washington invested more than a billion dollars, but already AstraZeneca is celebrating and preparing to present its findings to the FDA, looking for emergency authorization. A virus that has moved sickeningly fast, but now the vaccine breakthroughs accelerating. A Eurozone business activity contracted sharply this month as renewed lockdowns forced many firms in the bloc's dominant service industry to close temporarily, uh, although new, uh, news of a possible vaccine boosted hopes for 2021. Vaccine hopes may have given Europe a boost on Monday, but fresh economic data showed the damage being done in the Eurozone. Business activity contracted sharply this month amid renewed lockdowns that have hammered the bloc's dominant services industry. The sector in Germany, Europe's largest economy, contracted faster this month, while other surveys showed that in France the economy shrank at the fastest pace since May. A PMI covering the Eurozone service industry fell to 41.3, its weakest reading since the height of the first wave of the pandemic. The bloc's economy is on track for its first double-dip recession in nearly a decade. IHS Markets' headline flash composite PMI, seen as a good guide to economic health, fell to 45.1 in November. That was from October's 50, the level separating growth from contraction. Manufacturing, though, has fared better as many factories have remained open. Its flash PMI held well above the break-even mark at 53.6 in November. And with vaccines looking increasingly likely to be rolled out in the first half of the year, the surveys show greater optimism about 2021. Britain, which is outside the Eurozone and European Union, took a major hit to its huge services sector. Bank of England Chief Economist Andy Haldane said on Monday he hoped the economy would be turning a leaf next year, but warned that some long-term damage was inevitable. Well, Indonesia's confirmed COVID-19 case, uh, case numbers has exceeded 500,000. As the country continues to endure the strain of the coronavirus pandemic, nearly nine months since it reported the first infections back in March. 
Hospitals across Indonesia are close to breaking point with COVID-19 patients as the country passed half a million cases of the disease on Monday. Deaths also hit a grim milestone on the same day, surpassing 16,000. Patient occupancy at 27 referral hospitals in the capital of West Java province, home to almost 50 million people, was 88.8%. More than 502,000 infections have been recorded in Indonesia and public health experts say shortfalls in testing and contact tracing suggest the real numbers are likely to be significantly higher. In Jakarta, where relatively loose social restrictions remain in place until the end of next week, locals met the milestone with glum resignation. Epidemiologists warn Indonesia's struggle with the virus is far from over. One was quoted as saying infection rates are still increasing in all provinces. Nowhere has reached its peak. The head of the COVID-19 task force has called for more action to ensure hospital occupancy does not rise further. Well, first came denial, now comes acceptance. Donald Trump, the incumbent U.S. president, has accepted a former U.S. transition should begin for President-elect Joe Biden to take office. The president said that the federal agency overseeing the handover must do what needed to be done, even as he vowed to keep contesting his election defeat. Meanwhile, President-elect Joe Biden has gone ahead in appointing key roles in his new government. Former Secretary of State John Kerry who led a Resolution 30-1 against Sri Lanka in the UNHRC, will be leading the climate change effort in his new administration. After four years of President Trump often at odds with the foreign policy establishment, tonight President-elect Joe Biden is pulling from that group for his first cabinet picks, naming his longtime foreign policy advisor, Tony Blinken, to serve as Secretary of State. Blinken has been at Biden's side for nearly 20 years in the Senate and in the vice president's office. My mentor, my partner, my friend, and the greatest public servant I know, the vice president of the United States, Joe Biden. Biden turning to another familiar face, former Secretary of State John Kerry, to serve as his climate czar, a key focus of Biden's campaign. Combating climate change means jobs. Biden also naming veteran State Department official Jake Sullivan, formerly one of Hillary Clinton's closest aides, to be national security advisor. That another Washington veteran, former Fed chair Janet Yellen, is the choice for Treasury Secretary. To be announced soon, she'd be the first woman in that post. And two more firsts on Biden's national security team announced today. Avril Haines tapped to be the next director of national intelligence. If confirmed, she'll be the first woman to lead the intel community. And Alejandro Mayorkas, a Cuban-American who would be the first immigrant and Latino to serve as Homeland Security Secretary. Well, the United Kingdom's government has begun discussions on whether it is appropriate for British judges to continue to sit on Hong Kong's top court following China's imposition of a national security law in the territory and the disqualification of elected legislators that Britain has said is in breach of international laws. Let's get the very latest on that story. And for that, let's cross over to the world news special correspondent, Dilini Senebratna, standing by in London with the latest. Dilini? Mahesh, Britain is considering pulling its judges out of Hong Kong's highest court in its latest response to what it considers China's breaches of its international obligations in the territory. London has also objected to new rules imposed by mainland China to disqualify elected legislators in Hong Kong and to what it describes as retribution by the territory's executive against political opposition and silencing of dissent. The presence of foreign judges in Hong Kong is enshrined by the Basic Law, the mini-constitution that guarantees the global financial hub's freedoms and extensive autonomy under Chinese rule, including the continuation of Hong Kong's common law traditions forged during the British colonial era. The Hong Kong government hit back at what it described as sweeping attacks and groundless accusations, adding they were irresponsible remarks by the foreign secretary. 
About 13 foreign judges currently serve as non-permanent judges on Hong Kong's top court, including nine British jurists. Back to you, Manish. All right, Delini Senigaratna, the Wall News special correspondent uh, reporting from London in the UK with regard to that story. Thank you very much. Let's take a short commercial break. More Wall News on the other side. Welcome back everyone to World News. Now a contentious meeting between the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salam, and Israeli Prime Minister has been left in a complete vacuum as both parties seems to not give a clear view on what happened. Other than a World News Special Correspondent, Christina Almeida is following that story and she joins me now with the latest from Riyadh. Christina? Yes, Mahesh. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu traveled to Saudi Arabia and met its crown prince in what would be the first publicly confirmed visit there by an Israeli leader as the country's close ranks against Iran. Earlier, Israeli media said Netanyahu had secretly flown to New York on the Red Sea to have talks with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Reports of the meeting between the Crown Prince and Netanyahu were denied by the Saudi Arabia Foreign Minister. Palestinian militant groups condemned the news of a soft Saudi line on their enemy Israel. There have been widespread speculation with Israel and the US. The Washington may push for other Arab states to follow suit before President-elect Joe Biden is sworn in. Publicly, Saudi Arabia has said it would stick to decades-old Arab League position of not having ties with Israel until the Jewish state's conflict with the Palestinians is resolved. Back to you, Mahish. Christina Almeida in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, other than a World News Special Correspondent reporting there. Thank you. Now, an ultimatum has been issued by Ethiopia's government to bring an end to the conflict in Tigray. 72 hours given for opposition forces to surrender. Amid a 72-hour ultimatum to surrender, forces of Ethiopia's Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, or TPLF, have destroyed an airport serving the ancient town of Aksum, state-affiliated media said on Monday. The town, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, is claimed by Ethiopians as one of the world's oldest centres of Christianity. Legend has it Aksum was once home to the Queen of Sheba and that a church there housed the Ark of the Covenant. Its history and ruins, including 4th century obelisks from when the Aksumite Empire was at its height, have also been a major tourist draw. But today, it's embroiled in a conflict that has killed hundreds, possibly thousands, and that continues to send refugees fleeing from Tigray into neighboring Sudan. Coming from region. In the border town of Hamdayet, this refugee says people were shot at by the military. There are a lot of wounded people. There are a lot of people here suffering from malaria. Which... The government of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed denies hitting civilians, saying they are pursuing the facilities and leaders of the TPLF. He's given the region's ruling party until Wednesday to lay down their arms or face a final assault on Tigray's capital, Mekele. Now, a Belgian security researcher has discovered a method to override and hijack the firmware of Tesla Model 10, allowing him to steal any car that isn't running on the latest software update. Tesla is said to be working on a security vulnerability on its Model X vehicle, which reports say can be stolen with a smartphone. A computer researcher and renowned white hat hacker from Belgium told that he can break into a Model X using a smartphone controlled hardware kit that can be purchased online. He said the $300 kit can unlock the car remotely via Bluetooth from within 15 meters of the owner's key fob. The researcher informed Tesla of his findings and said the automaker is working to fix the issue. Well, better air quality has led to a significant reduction of premature deaths over the past decade in Europe. However, the European Environmental Agency's latest official data shows that almost all Europeans still suffer from air pollution 
leading to about 400,000 premature deaths across the continent. European citizens will be breathing a healthier sigh of relief, as a new study shows the continent's air quality improved over the last 10 years. The report published Monday by the European Environmental Agency says that air pollution from nitrogen oxide, one of the main greenhouse gases, fell significantly between 2009 and 2018. But the report isn't all positive. There's been less progress in the agriculture sector and the area of residential heating, where emissions only saw a small decline. And the full impact of Europe's lockdown period, where dramatic improvements in air quality were seen, isn't included either. But the agency did collect some positive data from it. Air pollution in 2018 caused the premature deaths of nearly 400,000 people in the EU. So there is still work to be done in this area. But the report also stresses that member states and local authorities' efforts also made it possible to prevent 60,000 premature deaths in the same year. But General Motors is recalling 7 million pickups and SUVs worldwide with airbags made by the same manufacturer whose airbags are linked to at least 17 deaths in the United States. The decision comes more than six years after initial recalls linked to the Takata airbags began in 2014. Tonight, General Motors forced to pump the brakes on six million of its SUVs and pickup trucks from 2007 to 2014, including models like the Cadillac Escalade and Chevy Silverado that used Takata airbags at the center of the largest recall in U.S. auto history, linked to 18 deaths. The nonprofit Center for Auto Safety opposed GM's four-year fight against this latest recall. The federal government found otherwise. General Motors says safety and trust are at the forefront, although we believe a recall of these vehicles is not warranted based on the factual and scientific record. We will abide by NHTSA's decision. The recall coming with a hefty bottom line, more than a billion dollars. Going back to the movies seems to be the new normal once again. That story right out of this commercial break. You're watching World News. Now, Sign World, the world's second largest cinema chain, has secured more than $750 million of extra funding after the closure of its screens across the US and UK forced it into emergency talks with lenders. Cinema has been an industry hit particularly hard by global lockdowns this year, but a rescue package arrived for a leading company Monday. Cineworld announced it had secured $750 million funding to protect itself from the impact of the health crisis. The British company, which owns the US Regal cinema chain, has seen several rounds of debt reordering and restructuring since March. The funding should help the company keep going into the new year, when Cineworld expects movie fans to return to screenings. This year, with lockdowns restricting how much people can do, Cineworld has closed theatres and cut costs to $60 million a year. It has shut 536 Regal theatres in the US and 127 of its sites in the UK. Cineworld said it had agreed long-term rent deferrals with key landlords and new lease agreements in some cases. Along with the new warrants, the firm said it had secured $450 million in new loans. Cineworld has been carrying heavy debt due in part to its $3.6 billion buyout of Regal in 2018. The company's base case scenario assumes it has enough money to reopen venues by next May. Shares in Cineworld jumped 20% in response to the deal, as investors also welcomed more positive results from vaccine trials. The head of the African Football Association, Ahmed Ahmed, has been banned from football for five years by FIFA, following an ethical investigation by the world's football's governing body. The head of African soccer has been banned from the sport for five years, following a FIFA ethics investigation. Ahmed Ahmed, the president of the Confederation of African Football, had been intending to stand in an election in March. But on Monday, the sport's global governing body said its independent ethics committee had found him guilty of offering and accepting gifts and other benefits and a misappropriation of funds. Corruption allegations were sent to FIFA's investigations committee in 2019 by former General Secretary Amar Fami including that Ahmed had ordered the payment of $20,000 in bribes to African Soccer Association presidents. 
and that he had cost CAF an extra $830,000 by ordering equipment via a French intermediary company called Tactical Steel. That company denied any wrongdoing. Other accusations included that Ahmed had harassed four female staff and overspent more than $400,000 of CAF money on cars in Egypt and Madagascar. FIFA's statement on Monday said Ahmed is now banned from all football-related activity at both national and international level for five years. He was also fined about $200,000. And finally tonight, China launched a robotic spacecraft to bring back rocks from the moon in the first bid by any country to retrieve samples from the lunar surface since the 1970s, a mission that underscores Chinese ambitions in space. China on Tuesday launched an unmanned spacecraft to a previously untouched part of the moon to bring lunar rocks back to Earth. The mission of the Chang'e 5 probe, named after the ancient Chinese goddess of the moon, is to collect four and a half pounds of samples to help scientists understand more about the moon's origins and formation. If successful, it would make China only the third country to have retrieved lunar samples after the U.S. and the Soviet Union. In one lunar day, or about two weeks here on Earth, China will try to collect the material from an unvisited area in a massive lava plain on the moon. The samples will then be transferred to a return capsule and sent back to Earth. It's a test for China ahead of more complex missions. Within the next decade, China plans to establish a robotic base station to conduct unmanned exploration in the south polar region of the moon. And it plans to retrieve samples from Mars by 2030. China's current mission comes as NASA is planning to send robotic rovers to the moon before an eventual human landing, for the first time since 1972. Beautiful, just beautiful. Well, why don't we have all the countries working together to find a new world? Because this one seems to be a big group. <laughs> Well, that is a part of your world tonight. Thank you very much for joining me. I'll be back again tomorrow at the same time with another edition of World News. I'm Ahish Johnny. Stay safe, stay well, and have a good night.